Welcome to Laurier's Teaching Excellence Conversation Series. I'm Mary Wilson, Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning at Wilfrid Laurier University, and today I'm with Michael Sinelli from Laurier's Kinesiology and Physical Education Program. Michael received the 2022 Hoffman Little Award, which celebrates faculty who deeply inspire students, contribute to their communities, and have distinguished themselves as thoughtful leaders and innovators. Michael is definitely a thoughtful and committed educator whose excitement and enthusiasm for his students' success is immediately evident. As a teacher, he is creative and collaborative, and as a mentor, he continuously seeks out ways to create exciting classroom and lab experiences for students. I'm excited to get to talk to Michael and to learn more about his approach to teaching. So Mike, it is absolutely uh, a privilege to sit down and talk to you about teaching and course design and assessment, particularly as a science educator and in such a difficult uh, area of science education around anatomy with all of its complexities uh, at, at both the undergraduate uh, level as well as the graduate level. And one of the things that was remarked upon most uh, when folks were looking at your uh, teaching award package was the great work that you do in mentorship, uh, both for undergraduate students and graduate students. So can you talk a little bit about how you think about your role as a mentor, both for undergraduate students and graduate students, globally as well as individually, and how have you learned to mentor? Um, how, how does that uh, sort of color or inform your work on a daily basis? Uh, and, and what might you advise others to do when thinking about their role as a mentor? Well, I'm glad you started off with that one because um, mentorship is always a thing that I think is goes hand in hand with teaching. I think we are mentors. We're not sitting up on this you know, higher pedestal and, and looking down upon people. I think we're mentors. We are there, even my philosophy of how I believe we should teach. It's more about helping and guiding and being there to mentor people. And I think going back to my days of an undergrad, and I think about the people who touched me the most or who had the most influence on me, and they were mentors. Um, they were mentors inside and outside the classroom. So inside the classroom, they mentored by us learning from them and, and their experiences and the material. But outside the classroom, if you the way they carry themselves and behaved, um, their dedication to the department and the students, and those are the ones that influenced me the most. And so becoming a, coming down this path, um, I've always enjoyed the mentorship. I've been a hockey coach since I was the age of 17. Um, so right from that young age, teaching young players how to become, how to learn the skills to be hockey players. And hockey school is a great way to really understand what it is to teach someone because you're not teaching plays, you're teaching skills and your skill development, which is the same as what we do in the classroom is we build on fundamental knowledge. And, you know, the example that I always like to think about is, you know, in hockey, you can't understand plays if you don't have the basic toolkit. And same thing in education. If you don't understand the basic fundamentals, then you can't move on to understanding larger concepts. And so mentorship is that way in which you can get people on board with you to listen to you and buy in. And I know that expression gets used a lot, like buy in, you know. Um, and I don't really always say, oh, you gotta buy in. It's more based on your my behaviors and the way I reach out to students and, and un, try and gauge their understanding. Um, and then mentorship, that's in the classroom. And then outside the classroom, I always take a look at students who are interested in my particular area of research and I help guide them along the way of a down a research path, a path that they may not have realized was available to them or they may not have realized that they're actually pretty good in that area. And so I always kind of joked saying that uh, because I teach, I used to teach a first year, second year, third and a fourth year course. And I would do this uh, training or grooming protocol where I'd see them in first year, I'd kind of see who the students who could think a little bit outside the box. And the second year, I'd see them again. 
And then by third year when I'm teaching course, a course that's more relevant to my research area, I would say, okay, does this student still understand the area and so on? And I would keep in, in touch with them. And those students who I know have that somewhat, have maybe that passion for the research, but maybe don't know they do, that's when I reach out to them and say, would you like to um, volunteer in the lab? Or, would, or at the end of third year, I'd say, you're really good in this area. Have you ever thought about doing an undergraduate thesis project? And so um, every year I mentor anywhere from three to five uh, undergraduate thesis projects. And those are students that I've seen along the way. And I kind of look at them and I pick up key features that I think um, would be well suited in a lab setting. Because I think a lab setting, there's nothing that matches learning in a lab setting, like the hands-on learning. And, and learning from doing. And that goes back to you know, coursework that have labs that you learn by doing. But that, yeah, that mentorship is all present along the way. You're mentoring somebody to say, hey, I think you're gonna be good at this. And then once they see that you have faith in them, then they wanna come along too. Um, so that's you know, that, that process of mentorship. And a lot of those students I've seen uh, finish their undergraduate thesis project some of them do continue graduate school um, and do very well. And then some go on to professional schools and, uh, or uh, work the workforce. But they've always said to me, I wish more people were able to do this, this experience. And I said, so do I, but <laughs> there are only a few <laughs> of us around. Yeah I, yeah. yeah, I really yeah. have to limit myself to how many. And I really have a tough time saying no to students who I believe are gonna be excellent researchers. And I don't even care if they're gonna be excellent in my lab. There have been students where I've said, You're, you'd make a great uh, researcher. Have you thought about doing a, a undergraduate thesis project? And I said, I can talk to you more about it and tell you about people in the department and their research and, and kind of guide them that way. It's not that I think that research is the end goal for everyone. I just think that identifying those individuals who might be good and get this experience, that. You know, I don't want them coming back at the end of their undergrad and said, oh, I wish somebody had told me about an undergrad thesis project. Well, I want to be that advocate for them. And then just by the same way I do it in, in outside the classroom, in the classroom, I kind of help guide students along with learning. Uh, the, so I mentor them by helping them learn material. So if I show them ways in which, hey, look, I struggled too as an undergraduate, and these are things that helped me and so I'll provide them many different ways of, of figuring it out. Um, and so I think that's, you know, going back, I know I've kind of circled the question, but I do believe that there's every aspect of our job involves some sort of mentorship. And, and I think it's mentoring by showing, A, that you're human, and B, that you are there for them to help them out and, and willing to listen, because that is, that is our job. And that's why I came into this area of, of this profession is because I like I was touched by people I saw what they did for me and I wanted to do that for others so um, pay it forward I guess uh, for others so as you're telling that story one of the things that I'm thinking about is uh, everything that you do to individually encourage awareness of students capacities and strengths and possibilities and well, as you say, research and, and furtherance in graduate education or in academia is one angle. As a community, we have to create opportunities for students to explore all of their passions and interests and areas of possibility. Uh, whereas you can contribute specifically around um, that, that research project format that you do and the coaching and mentoring you do throughout their undergraduate experience. But, I was thinking as well about the limitations of grades um, because I bet the majority of those students are earning respectable, if not good grades in the discipline, yeah. but they don't have the confidence to know that they can and should pursue it further until they hear from you uh, and until you hold up a mirror for them and help them to see the areas of strength that they have and, and help them to sort of, I don't know, acknowledge or encourage their curiosity and legitimize that. Um, and, and I think sometimes we forget the value of that as educators, uh, that those conversations with students are quite inspirational uh, and that they really can help students to 
get a better hold on what it is that they own in terms of their knowledge and their skills and their curiosity and what they can do as a consequence of that, what their options are. So I think that that insight is, is really valuable. How does it change for graduate students or does it particularly change? Well, you know, the, the shift changes. There's a, it's a big jump from an undergraduate degree to a graduate degree. And I always tell my, my students, my incoming students, it's a jump, but I'll be there to help you um, with this. I've been doing it long enough that I, I understand what, what the jump is. And mentorship in that respect is a little bit different um, because you go from an undergraduate degree where your schedule is pretty set for you. You've got your five courses, let's say, or if you're taking undergraduate thesis projects, so four courses plus your undergraduate thesis. And so your time scale is pretty set for you and you have a pretty set working uh, schedule and you know how to work around that. When you become a graduate student, you've got to juggle TA, so being a teaching assistant, uh, some coursework, I mean, it's minimal, um, and, and think about your research, because you, as a master's student, you have two years, as a PhD student, you have four, maybe five years to think of a series of studies. And so, you know, it's a little bit different. The conversations are different. Uh, the mentorship is similar. So what I do with all my students is I have one-on-one -on -one meetings, kind of like conversations like you and I are having right mm -hmm. now. I meet with each one of them on a one-on-one -on -one basis every two weeks. And the reason why I do it two weeks is because we think about, we talk about where things are at and things that they should get done. And a two week scale is enough of a window that if they have a busy week, then they can offset the busy week with a not so busy week. And I always find that two weeks is enough for them to make uh, contributions to their, their research or studies. But the other thing too, with all of them in those meetings, it's um, you got to keep in mind that they are humans. And so, <laughs> I start off all my meetings with saying, how are you? And I wanna know how they are because if it's a stressful, you know, doing, fitting in an undergraduate thesis project or fitting in your research with a master's degree, during your master's degree with coursework and TAing and a personal life, it can be stressful. And so I first wanna see how they're doing. How, the, how they, are they feeling overwhelmed? And if they are, um, I say, okay, let's put the brakes on, let's stop, let's reorganize this. And with the graduate students, it's a little bit, the conversation's different, because I can say to a master's student, okay, first year, what I want you to do is I want you to think about a pie, and you break that pie up into thirds. And I say, for the first year, all I really want you to do is a third of that pie is your coursework, a third is your TA, the other third is your me time. And document, like over the next two weeks, I want you to kind of see how much time you're putting into each. If it's out of whack, let's talk about that. And notice how I said to them, your research will come, we'll do that later. But if you have time, then we'll, we'll add that on. Um, and that starts, I said, as coursework reduces, then we, we offset that with your research work. And I found that that, when they start thinking about it that way, they start realizing, okay, you know, I don't have to do everything. Mike's not asking me to do, be a superhuman. Um, I don't want students to burn out. Burnout can happen. There's, it, it's, it's a high stressful anxiety environment, but it doesn't have to be. And that's what our, our role as supervisors are, is to have foresight and to see, okay, well, let's, let's put your focus here. And I'd be lying if I said all my, all my grad students went through their grad degree easily. I, you know, they kind of joke about it, they, saying that, you know, who hasn't cried in front of their supervisor? <laughs> And it's true, but I want them to feel comfortable that yeah. the, I can be that person. And it's not, they're not crying because of I've, anything I've done to them. It's because things seem overwhelming. And there have been students where I've said, you know what, you need to take a break. Let's go through the process of, of taking a, a break, a, a temporary leave. Or in, I remember one student, I saw this student at a conference uh, last week that I just came back from, and the student just finished up um, her PhD. And, but during her master's degree, the first year, I basically said, okay, she was having a rough, she came to me, we had this meeting, and I said, okay, let's stop everything. Let's just, you know, take this term and figure out what you want to do. And no obligations, nothing. And it's probably, and she thanked me for that, because it's probably the, one of the best things that happened to her, because then she was able to pick it up and turn it around. 
uh, and finish up really strong and go on to do a PhD. And now she's in the workforce and, and, and loving it. So, um, so she's, I'm, I'm not saying I was that person that, that did it for her, but there are little things like that where we have to understand as supervisors that they are human, we are human, and we gotta get that human element first taken care of. And sometimes when you reach out to somebody like that, they will be more likely to be more productive because they realize, oh, I'm not just you know, this working machine or the, my supervisor isn't expecting me to be a machine. They expect, they understand that there's, there's gonna be times where I'm not gonna be able to do as much as possible. And the other thing that I find to be uh, with my grad students and my undergrads is that, you know, I set examples, I set uh, motivations or standards by doing work myself. So I'm in there working and they see me doing work and they see, I, I know I'm, I should try and not stay up late any, <laughs> at, at night anymore, but it's, you know, it's not uncommon for them to get emails from me at 1 a.m. But I don't want emails back. It just happens to be that that's when I'm thinking of things and I'll send an email. I, I've stopped doing that over the last couple of years just because um, <laughs> sleep's very yeah, important. It is. Um, so, yeah. so, but that's the thing that I want them to see, like I'm invested in this as much as you are. And I also get excited about all their projects. And so I think that also helps too. And in the classroom too, um, I, students have said like, wow, you bring excitement. It's like, yeah, I love this stuff. I think it's, I think it's interesting. You should find it interesting. And same thing in the, in the, in the, in the lab setting, it's like, I'm excited about it. You should be excited about it. Uh, and I don't have to say it. I don't have to convince any of my students to be excited about their stuff because they, they choose their project. Um, and that's another key part too, to getting with the, with all my students, even the undergraduates, graduates, I do this too. So getting to learn about them and learning who they are. I first say, okay, who are you? Tell me who you are. Tell me about why, or why might you be interested in my area? And then I say, okay, and here's my research program. Can we mesh my research program with your interests? And we start tossing around ideas. And this, this happens all the time. Like this is what I do with every single student. And I, I found that if you have a personal attachment to the research you're doing, you're gonna enjoy it more. And if it fits my research program, it, and then it's, you know, it's a bonus, bonus. for me. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, and so that's what I try and do. And if, if um, sometimes I get the students who like my research program and say, well, I kind of, you know, what about this? Or they'll ask me a question about, have you thought about this? And I said, well, that's a very good question. Um, let's explore how we would go about that. And so that's how the conversations first start with, with the students. And I've had these conversations with my incoming undergraduate students. So I have four incoming uh, graduate, uh, graduate thesis students, undergraduate thesis students. And I've had this conversation with all four of them. So I know exactly, they know and I know what uh, they're doing uh, when they come back in September. And I've had the conversation with all my incoming master's students. So they all know where their research program is heading. Um, but that's kind of in the back of their mind. Uh, so, cause they have two years to do it, but the undergrads have to hit the ground running. Um, but yeah, I think it's mostly, and each one of them have a different project. They all fit under my research umbrella, my research program umbrella, but all of them are individualized to that person. Um, and so, and I'm excited about all of them. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's, and that's, I love that every year. Um, you know, I look forward to the next group coming in because the new projects, uh, you know, how's this pushing my research program a little bit more? And, uh, and so that's, you know, that's building a, I, I hopefully it's building a comfortable environment. So yeah, and you know, in the summertime, um, I'm in the lab every day. I actually was there this morning uh, working out some kinks. We got some new equipment, so we're playing around with the new equipment before the new studies start up. And I wanna be that first person to un unpackage it and set it up and play around with it. And, um, and so that's a common thing. So them seeing me in the lab doing this stuff or seeing me um, working on stuff and working with them. And I've always said to them, you know, you work with me. You don't work for me, you don't work under me, you work with me, let's work together on this. Um, and, and so that's the partnership that we have. So because it's what you do and how you approach uh, your courses and your lab, it may not seem extraordinary to you, but it is extraordinary. 
uh, it is not unusual for uh, for either uh, an undergraduate or a graduate mentor or educator to recognize the importance of work-life balance for students and for themselves, and to simply say that you need to achieve work-life balance. But what I hear from what you do, Mike, is you actually help the students with strategies, with frameworks, with ways of thinking. You give them permission um, to express those struggles and the vulnerability. And you also very overtly, and I think um, in, in a lovely way, <laughs> help them to celebrate learning as a process rather than as an outcome. And I think often now in education, we feel obliged to complete undergraduate degrees or graduate degrees in order to achieve some financial status or social cultural status. And it, it becomes something that you get and then run with rather than something that you experience and enjoy. And learning is struggle sometimes. Mm -hmm. But that struggle can be joyful when you start to overcome it, when you learn new strategies for solving problems, for solving complex dynamics in lab environments, um, for learning new techniques, for framing out your life in a way that you can sustain and wash over against other parts of, of what you're going to do over the course of your lifetime. Mm -hmm. And you have a joy for your discipline, like a real palpable interest in your field of research. And uh, it, it's, it's a repeated conversation with educators, the value and the importance of putting that on display genuinely for your students, that that's why you're in your field, that's why you've chosen to be an educator, that's why you continue to research, because you are curious about it, because it matters, it's consequential for the human's experience, for our knowledge. Um, and to, and to share that excitement, and we sometimes forget the importance of demonstrating our passion for our subject matter and how compelling that is, how inspirational that is for students. So if you don't know that about yourself as an educator, it is, uh, it's, it's not universal. It's, it's something that some folks work their entire career to cultivate, and it's something that you evidently have in abundance. And I know you teach a lot of different uh, courses, but I want to I want to talk a little bit specifically about anatomy education because okay. I think anatomy is unique, right? It's, it is. I'm not I'm not going to do it justice, but it is systems, processes, structures, diseases. It's very holistic, and it, um, it's also very distinctive. Uh, how do you know how to teach that well? How, how how do you decide how to format your curriculum, how to choose what kind of learning experiences to engage your students in, and how in the world do you assess in a way that gives you comfort and them comfort? Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a big question, something that it, I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna lie, it's an evolving process. And uh, I always think, when it comes to anatomy, I always think I could be better. And you know, it's, it's a course that I'm not, an anatomist. I'm not uh, trained that way. It is part of what we do. And I think because of that, because it's more of a foundational fundamental course as necessary for so many other courses, I think that's why it requires so much uh, an evolution of how you, you, you present the material and how you teach it. And because you want students to understand the, the benefit of it. And in terms of picking tools and stuff, there are so many tools out there, but I think when it comes down to what I choose and how I choose to teach it and what, how I assess them is based on what I believe they need to have at the end of it. And then once I think about, okay, well, what do I want them, the objectives, what do I want them to have at the end of the course? And then understanding them as learners and who they are, where they, so I understand the programs that they come from or, or and where this is in terms of their curriculum and, or where this is in their academic career. And so knowing where they came from and what courses they need this to go into, and then understanding myself and, and my knowledge and my uh, strengths. And so not only understanding them, but also understanding your, yourself. And, um, 
I teach anatomy. There's a couple of different ways people have will teach anatomy. And we've chosen here to choose a regional approach. Now that what that means is that we go through each region of the body and talk about the, the muscles, the, the musculoskeletal system and the nerve supply and blood supply uh, for those regions. And the reason for that is most students, as a because I am in the kinesiology department, and most of the students are in uh, the kinesiology department, they will need this understanding to, to move on. And so when I thought about how to present this course, before I even started, stepped foot in, in an anatomy lecture at Laurier, I reached out to colleagues who were teaching anatomy and asked them what they did, uh, what textbooks they used, what resources they used, uh, took a look at their syllabi and kind of formulated what I thought I would like to do. Now, prior to coming to Laurier, I had the benefit of teaching as a PhD student, I taught a, a neuroanatomy course. Now, neuroanatomy is a different beast altogether, but that really got me thinking about, well, what is it that, how do I think about this? How do I learn the material? Things, I always say to people, things never came easy to me. There are some people who, where information comes easy to them. I have a brother like that, and it just comes easy to him. It always drove me crazy. Uh, but I always had to work hard at, at understanding things. I had to find new techniques to help store things in memory or learn material. And so the first thing I always say to students in anatomy specifically is you don't memorize anatomy, you learn anatomy. And they say, well, what's the difference? I said, well, the difference is if you learn something, then you won't forget it. And, and if you memorize it, you will forget it. So we're gonna take steps to learning material and the way I present the material and, and how I interact with the students and the questions I give them on the exam is teaching them how much do you actually know? Not how much can you memorize, how much do you know? And, um, I'll, and the way I do that is my exams have three tiers of questions and I tell them right from the start. There's tier one are your straight regurgitation ones. I don't really like those types of questions, so I limit those to about 20% of the exam. So I say to them, if you're gonna memorize this, I'll tell you what your mark's gonna be on the midterm. But the majority of the exam is what I call level two, which is understanding. So I'll say, you know, how are this structure and this structure, what's common about them or what's different about them? And, or I'll say, you know, what is, what is different? What doesn't belong in this, in these group of, of, of options because that's really testing their knowledge so what do you really know and then the third level is the applied questions and the reason I put applied questions in is for two reasons one most of these students would like to go on to some sort of professional degree yeah. later on and so they need to understand how do you take fundamental knowledge and apply it to a yeah. setting and throughout the year uh, I've started doing this COVID gave me an opportunity to really rethink of how I, I taught anatomy and what, was, what were best practices. And one of the things I started in uh, the anatomy classes with COVID was case studies. So every week we'd have a few case studies based on the material that we just covered. And I would pull the students to see how much they understood. And then we would take that question and break it down into, okay, well, why is this the correct answer? And, and I would say, look, you, do, you can't just accept that this is the right answer. Let's figure out why the other ones are not correct. And, and then we'd go through them and we'd spend an hour going through six questions. Because I said, each question, you should be able to learn something about each of these options. And so I, and then, so I, that applied setting gives them a way to think about, okay, I learned this and I learned that. Who cares? Well, our human body is, is our muscles and our bones are with us and we, we need those to produce movements and we produce movements throughout the day. So it is important. So we think about, we take some of those actions that we that we perform in a daily situation and think about them. And then on the exams, I have some case studies that they haven't seen before, but they should be able to work them out. And, and um, you know, something you said resonated with me because I spend most of my time when I, when, during my office hours with students, not teaching them material, but teaching them how to learn. So I'll give them, I'll say, okay, well, you know, there are different types of learners. Yeah. How do you learn best? And they may not know. I said, well, how are you studying for the exams? And this always happens after midterm. And it's usually the students who 
I see the exact, I've been doing this long enough that I see the same students all the time. It's the students who are very good students, but didn't do as well as they wanted to or believe that they should have. Uh, because anatomy gives you a false sense of, of hope at the end of a midterm <laughs> because it's multiple choice. There are an, there's an option for everything. And you're obviously circling an answer that you think is correct. So you walked away confident, but you may not have got that correct mark. So I'll sit down with them, go through their midterm. And just by looking at their midterm, if they, don't, if they don't tell me how they studied, I said, I can tell you how you studied. I know exactly how you studied based on what you got wrong. And, and so we'll go through that and say, okay, well, try some new techniques. Here are some new techniques I would like you to try. Here, I, I'll give them a couple options. I'll say, well, now you choose, but these are ways in which you're learning the material. And you know, one of the things that we're always taught here is active learning. I remember when I first came here, um, and it must have been my second year in all the workshops that, we, that I went to, it was always about active learning, active learning. I said, okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> and so you tell the students, okay, don't, don't be a passive learner. Don't just sit here and write notes, be active. And then you kind of leave it at that. But there were no tools in place, or I didn't place, put tools in place to help them know what it meant to be active. Once I understood how they could be active, then I would give them those tools if they met with me. Or sometimes in class, I would say, Okay, let's, let's take a step back and think about it this way. So if we're talking about a particular muscle, I say, okay, if we wanna go and strengthen this muscle, what might you do in a resistance way to train this muscle? And some of them have to say, well, you have to think about it. Well, how does this muscle move? Or uh, I'll stop and say, okay, well, I'll give you some of the information. Let's pull the class. And I'm not gonna say if you're right or wrong. Let's pull the class and say, what do you think this muscle does? Or, or, or something like that, just to get them engaged with, so, well, that's active learning. You're thinking about this and this, but how do, how, do, how do you solve what I'm asking you based on the two pieces of information I gave you? And so, you know, once I understood techniques of active learning, then I would start presenting them. And another thing that happened during COVID that I did last year for the first time, and I'll try it again this year, is I did a flipped classroom idea where I had pre-recorded lectures. I would give them, um, you know, the, the good thing that came out of COVID was I was able to break down anatomy into smaller chunks. Huge. Yeah. yeah. And, and we always talk about, I mean, I'm a motor control, motor learning person and motor learning chunking is the way we learn. <laughs> and so I was like, you know, for the first time I was like, well, why don't I put what I preach in motor control and, and, and bring it to anatomy? So what I did was I took uh, segments of the course and made smaller videos. So it was based on one topic and one topic only. And then I would have case, I would have some questions uh, using iClick or Cloud that they would answer. And then uh, during our meeting times, we would, I would go over, first thing I would say is any questions about the, the lecture, any of the material that you had questions about. And if they did, we would talk about them. And then I would bring up the iClicker questions to see if, where people had problems and bring those up and say, okay, or students would say, can you pull up question three? I didn't understand the, why you know, C was the correct answer, not B. And it's okay, but let's talk about it. Let's go through A, A to D or A to E if I had that. And let's talk about why B is the correct answer. Um, and so, and, and then uh, I would also bring in added material. So I have videos that I had, uh, which are videos of a, of a cadaver lab. So there's an anatomist who's created these beautiful videos um, with 3D views of, of cadavers. And so I'd pull up those to add more material. And then I, if I had time, I would do case studies. Not always, but we would, have, we would have case studies throughout the year, but there were some lectures that were better suited for case studies and some that weren't. So I would give them, they would have the lecture that they would have already in their pocket and come to class and, okay, you should have this knowledge. Let's talk about that more. Let's provide more information, more visuals, um, more questions, more understanding. And that's where I think, you know, active, that's active learning where they're, Force, not force, but they're provided the tools to help understand the material. And so, you know, people, there are other people who teach anatomy just trying to say, okay, you're gonna memorize this. I'm gonna walk you through it and you're gonna memorize it. Well, that's not fun, because I know if I was a student in that class, I wouldn't enjoy it. And some people maybe do want that, but I, I didn't like that. I needed something else. And so when I was a student learning, I would think about, how do I apply this? How, do, how does this make sense? And so fortunately for me, um, my undergraduate focus, when I was doing my undergraduate, we were able to focus in areas and I focused on 
sport injury management. I thought that was the area I was going to go down, so I wanted to focus on sport in, injury and management and um, took all the required courses. I TA'd them as, as, a, as a grad student. And so I was bring that experience to the classroom. And I was also a team trainer, um, an undergraduate team trainer with varsity level sports when I was an undergrad. And so I bring those experiences with me to the classroom and I'll tell it, talk about stories. And I still coach, so I sometimes have stories about coaching or, or other things. So bringing in stories where students may be able to reflect on their own lives and apply what they're learning to their own lives, that's an easy way that, or I think it's kind of easy to get them to think, oh, this is, makes sense. And they won't forget those. They won't forget the stories. They, don't, they don't, won't forget these applications, and that's part of learning. They may forget you know, what day we covered this muscle, but they won't forget if I start talking about things at that classroom, they'll say, oh yeah, I remember that was the example you gave, or this is the story, and that's what I want. I want them to remember those days. And that's, when I sit down with the students and I say to them, this is how you're gonna learn the material, I, I kind of reflect back on that. So one of the examples, whether it's good or not, but I always seem to think maybe it helps them, but uh, I provide, no pun intended, but skeleton, um, <laughs> skeleton uh, slides for them. And basically it just has some figures or some, some outline, and then they use those to fill in uh, during the lecture, the notes. And I always say to them, I say, one thing I'd like you to do when you're preparing for a midterm is the title slide. The title slide tells you exactly what we're talking about in that lecture, pull it up and write down everything you remember from that lecture. And then I said, it's, you're not being evaluated on it, but what it's telling you is giving you an indication of how much you retained from that lecture yes, and how much you need to work on that lecture. So if you can write a page, guess what? You already know that stuff. You might need to work on a different area. Um, and so once you take all these, these title pages, start at the ones that you have very little information written because you didn't remember. And it could be a bunch of reasons. It could be A, the, you weren't, pay, you weren't um, maybe very attentive to that, that, that class. Um, maybe it was the, the material was too difficult, or maybe you just didn't put the time in that was needed uh, to retain that information. And so start there. And, I, and it's the same thing I say in coaching too. It's like, you know, if you're good at this, that's great. But if I can find your weakness, it's gonna spend more time on your weakness to elevate it to the level of your strengths. That's what you want. Same thing with, with school. Why would you keep going back to what you know when really you should be working on what you don't know? And I always say, we as humans don't like to be told what we don't know. It's, <laughs> I don't like to be told what I, I mean, most of us don't like to be told what we don't know. But I said, this, here's a way that you're showing yourself what you know and what you don't know. If you don't do this, I'll guarantee you, when you go to study, you're gonna start off with the stuff that you know. Yes, And then you're gonna run out of time. There. Yeah, you're gonna yeah. run out of time and not get to the stuff that you don't know. What I want you to do is elevate your understanding of the material that you don't know right now. And so, like I said, I spend more time teaching them how to learn than I do the material. Because uh, once they learn how to learn, I think the material's right there. Um, and that is, you know, that's a course that I said is always evolving. I'm always, this time of year, I always keep thinking, okay, what am I gonna do in the fall? Am I gonna do the same thing? Am I gonna change it? So this year for the first time, I'm going to, we're fully in person. So I'm gonna try the flipped classroom, kind of like what I did this year, and use the lecture time to really plug away at their understanding of the material and really help them, provide them with tools to better understand. Because lectures, the good thing with the lecture being recorded, it's always there. They can they always can go back to it. They can it at their own pace. Yeah, yeah. go at their own pace. Yeah. I, give them, um, I give them 20 hours to view the video, and it's not very long. The longest video I think I had last year was 40 minutes, which I, it was one topic. I couldn't break it down to anything small, and I, I'd say to them, okay, this is going to be But they can pause it. They, they can. go back. Yeah. And, yeah. Take a bathroom break, yep. uh, walk around or whatever, yeah. or listen to it multiple times. Yes. And last year, um, my class had the highest average that I've ever had in anatomy. Huh. And I don't know if it was, <laughs> you know, I changed two things, but I don't know, this year will really be telling to see if that continues. The other thing I did was I changed the way in which you asked in which I evaluate. Well, what I started finding with students time and time again is that uh, we'd go through their midterm and they would say, oh, I narrowed it down to, just like you told me, I narrowed it down to two and I chose the wrong one. 
okay, well, why did you choose the one you did? So then uh, with the help of, of Mary Scott, um, we were able to find a way remotely having the exam through um, through through uh, re respondents, yeah, yeah, respondents um, lockdown to give them multiple option, multiple chances to answer the question, so that they would get if they got it on their first try, they get full marks. If they mm -hmm. got it on their second, they would get half marks, and the third, they would get point uh, one, which helps. They're learning. Yes. <laughs> yeah. the only, yes. Yeah. W w the only un the only downside of that is that they don't get immediate feedback. Uh, it's not built into the software. So this year, I'm going to try the scratch card idea. Oh, um, very good. So they get immediate feedback. Immediate so, feedback. So yeah. they know what's uh, what they got right and what they got wrong. So there's no there's no question when they're when they get their marks back what what their score was. Uh, and in that way, they're they're it's forcing them to to learn. Hopefully, it doesn't. I'm hoping that it decreases anxiety rather than increasing anxiety, but maybe the scratch cards and the immediate feedback might increase anxiety. So I'll have to see if that might be the best way. But yeah, again, it's always things I'm always thinking about. And I think it's because it doesn't come, and I say to students, I'm not an anatomist. Anatomy doesn't come naturally to, naturally to me. Um, I have to work at it. So every year I'm working at it to be better. And so I've just, I'm honest with them. I say, look, this is, you're, you're clearly a very capable teacher, though. I could take your commentary from the last few minutes and throw it up against a number of frameworks around teacher knowledge. Um, so you, you understand how to teach. You understand how to teach in your discipline. You understand the knowledge in your discipline. You understand how students learn. You understand how students learn in your discipline. And all of that weighs into your pedagogical decision making in a way that is clearly very dynamic and responsive to the individual student, which I think is um, quite extraordinary. There's a, a colleague of mine, um, Kevin Orr, who's doing some research out of the University of Hutter, Huddersfield in the UK on, on decision making of educators. Uh, and what I hear from your framing is that you seek to understand how the learner is approaching that complex body of knowledge, what they understand about it, where they are getting caught up, and then you are able to dynamically respond with a number of different strategies for an approach into learning. And not only can you do that on the fly with your students in the lab or in the class, you've structured it into your course, which I think is something that you may not even know you're doing because <laughs> you're just doing it, but it is very much in keeping with what we understand to be very effective teaching practice. Um, and, and you've got it uh, in evidence in, in your course. How did you learn that, Mike? And then when you think about like where you are as an educator in your teaching practice, what are you most curious about now? What do you want to learn about? Uh, what excites you about your teaching practice? What do you want to explore further? Yeah. Well, I'll start off with that one first. I think the thing I want to explore further is finding better ways to evaluate students' knowledge. I think the, the, the way of just going back and you know, having them write midterms and finals isn't always the, the, the best way of assessing what they know. And when I, so when I go into a course, uh, I actually don't have a cookie cutter type of, of paradigm that I use to evaluate the students. I base it on the course material, the year, and what, what I expect from them. So if you take a look at my syllabi of my first year, second year, third or fourth year courses, they're all different. So for instance, I just, I changed again during COVID. Um, you think I had too much time on my hands, but <laughs> I actually did quite a bit of, I guess not being in the lab, uh, we were still were publishing things, but I wasn't. We weren't collecting new data, so I put that time and effort towards um, courses. So I sat and looked at my fourth year course, and it was always a course that students struggled with, and I had changed it four times. Um, I think the first year I offered it. So I started in two thousand eight. I offered it for the first time in the winter of two thousand ten, and uh, when I was on sabbatical, I didn't teach it. So, but in those years. It had changed four times because every time I'm like, ah, the students just aren't, they're not prepared for where I, I want them to be. But why is that? Is it my job to 
So I always used to think it was my job to get them up to speed. But then I was finding that I was covering less and less material because I was spending more time understanding what they needed to, to know before doing my course. And then the evaluation of it, I said, there's got to be a better format to evaluate them. What I used to do was I used to do break the course up into four modules. So every three weeks we would have, a, I call it a quiz. And they always mm -hmm. joke, they're like, it's not a quiz, it's, it's a midterm. <laughs> So no, it's a quiz. It's 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 half a class. Uh, so it'd be out of an eighty-minute lecture, we'd do, do first forty, 40 minutes, minutes, and yeah. then we would talk about stuff. Um, and there was also a lab component. But then I thought, you know, you're in fourth year. What are the things that I? So I I, I sit on our grad committee. So I look at uh, uh, grad applications. applicants and so yeah. on. And I say, okay, what are these for incoming graduate students? What are they struggling with? Presentation skills, writing skills are two of the things. So. Uh, Two years ago, I, I changed my fourth year course to reflect what I think fourth years need coming out. So I turned it into a true seminar course. So what we do in the seminar course, it's uh, so it's offered twice a week, uh, 80 minutes twice a week. Day one, we will, so I'll give them a chapter to read. So we cover 12 chapters. So they'll read a chapter um, and I have targeted questions. So I've, I know the materials, it's in my area of research. So uh, they, I target the questions of, of things I really want them to focus in on the chapter. I found that that is the best, if you read things, you won't retain it. But if I give you a question, you're gonna retain that information. And so they would get that chapter ahead of time. And then we'd come to class, let's say it's, uh, it's, it's a Monday, Wednesday, let's say. So Monday, we would talk about that chapter. We'd bring up the questions and I would either do something called pair and share, which means you and a partner in the class will take a question, one of those questions. Usually there's 10 questions, so they'll take one of the questions and I'll assign them. And they'll talk about, well, what did you, how did you answer this? And what did you take from it? Perfect. And so on. Yeah. And then they would present yeah. it to the class. And that would be the whole 80 minutes. It'd be pairing and sharing. Or sometimes we would do, take it up as a class. So I'd say, okay, who wants to answer this one? And, and, uh, and, and we would go that way. Or there's different ways in which we would discuss them. It was great. And, in a remote setting because I could create these uh, breakout rooms and they would discuss them and so on. So it was either small group, paired or full class, depending on the material and so on. And then on the next day, two students, two or three students, depending on how large the class is, but two or three students would take uh, an article that was discussed in that chapter and then present it to the class. So the class didn't have the paper in front of them. So it's kind of like at a conference and your job is to present the, the, this paper to the group. So tell us what, you know, some background. What was the purpose of it? What did they do? What did they find? How does this contribute to our knowledge of, yeah. of the course? And then we would have question and answer period. And that would take up, and then we'd move on to the next chapter. And students have said to me, and maybe they're, they're being nice to me because they say it to my <laughs> face, but they said, that was the best course they've taken. It was, and I said to them, I said, it's a lot of work. You know, you're doing things, but it's not as if you're doing nothing, studying for a midterm, you write that midterm, and then you're kind of, you know, relaxed. There's no peaks and valleys. It's, it's basically you're plateauing. Like you're getting up there and you're keeping that keeping workload going. constant. And after a while, they don't feel like it's, it's overwhelming just because they're used to doing this. And the other thing, so I have them, um, when the, the days that we have the presentations, each person has to write a minute paper. And what a minute paper, it's a common, I know, I see you nodding, so you know the but, minute paper. Yeah, yeah but so I'm I have a fan, do, <laughs> so it's good. So I have them do these yeah. minute papers, and they submit them. And so they get graded on minute papers, they get graded on, two, they each do two oral presentations, so they get, get graded on those. And I have them write a review paper at the end of the year. So you are encouraging them to understand the structure of knowledge within the discipline, distill what is most important and communicate it in, in a way that I think would definitely help them to understand their access and facility with the conventions of uh, demonstration of knowledge in that discipline. So for an upper level course, trying to help graduating students demonstrate that knowledge, Michael, that's amazing. So now that we're talking, I was like, oh, what can I do about my third year course? <laughs> I, I redesigned it, I think, three years ago. And so I've offered it three times, and this will be my fourth offering of it because um, our program changed, and so I, I was asked to restructure that course. And now 
I've, the other two have reshaped to a point where I like them. But then this third year course, it's, I really, every year I tweak a little bit, but I'm wondering how much do I change this yeah. year going in? Because I do like the way I evaluate it. I think it's more about presentation of material. I'm a big fan, we were talking about lab settings, but in the third and fourth year, I think what's important is uh, dissemination of information or, or integration of information. Yes. Yeah. So we learn a lot from research studies. So everything we, t we learn in my area has come from studies. Well, I present the studies to them. So some of these seminal pieces of work, we'll talk about them and the importance of them and how they contribute to our knowledge. So it's a very, it's, it's a blend of research focused learning and some, you know, some, some knowledge that, uh, you know, I'll summarize some of the information that we've obtained through multiple studies. Uh, and so it's a mix of that. And the way I evaluate them is, again, it's a midterm, a final, and a, and a group paper. So they do a group paper together. On a, I get them to write a proposal. So like a master's level proposal, they work in a group, Very helpful. groups of three. Yeah. And, and, um, and so I, give them, I help them along the way. There's stages um, to, that they have to accomplish along the way. And same with my fourth year. It's not just, hey, write a paper. It's give me a topic do an annotated bibliography, I need to see an outline and so on. So they have these key uh, markers along the way. And the same thing with my, my third year course to a lesser extent. But I think it comes down to, is that the best presentation of the material? Is, can it be better? And I think with a course like that, because it's so, it, it's a common course, it's motor control and learning, and it's common across all kin programs and all kin programs, whoever's teaching it teaches it differently. And so- Fascinating. Uh, yes, yeah. and so I found a way that reflects the, the, my uh, interests in, 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 in that uh, topic area. And so I've broke it up into three modules and I always wonder if it's best to do, um, do module, modular midterms, but then I don't want to take away from their time on the paper. So, you know, I, I kind of struggle with this. So I think that's the thing. I, th I think that kind of puzzling um, is the mark of, again, a committed educator who can find persistent passion and interest in the cultivation of curriculum and teaching technique. So I think it's a, it's a great thing that you spend time going, I wonder about this, I wonder about that. And the, the, the recommendation that I always give to educators is try not to change so much in your course and in one iteration that you can't study the consequence of the intervention that right. you put in place, yeah. <laughs> right? So they, casting it as tweaking, thoughtful tweaking with reference to the literature, conversations with colleagues who teach similar courses and your own reflection on what you've observed in your students and your knowledge of the surrounding curriculum. It's a great approach for it. My thanks to Michael Sinelli for joining me today, and I hope you'll join me for more conversations that celebrate exceptional teaching practices, explore diverse teaching philosophies, and discuss the future of higher education, teaching, and learning.